Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us here on Wednesday. I was asked recently to give my testimony, and as, I'll, as always, uh, I always begin on uh, the basis of what Christ did in my life, uh, pretty much just skipping all of the ugly, horrible, tragic, disturbing, uncomfortable, just horrific events that took place in my life prior to that. I don't mean to sound critical. Tr truly, I, I don't. I, seriously, I do not mean to, to sound to come across as critical. But I have never believed that a testimony is been, is about anything other than what Christ has done in our life. I'm not going to spend 20 minutes or 28 minutes. I'm not going to just devote 28 minutes to telling you about every rotten thing that ever occurred in my life, which led me up to the point in which I accepted Jesus Christ as my life, and, and then spend the last two minutes telling you, well, he, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I think you should too. Yeah, it seems to me like, folks, I have really turned that whole thing around. And instead of talking about, you know, maybe for two minutes, okay, about all of this junk in my life, and then spend 28 minutes talking about everything he, he Christ done, had done in my life, what he did do in my life, uh, just what happened as far as what you know, my focus being on what Christ did in my life, it just seems to me like it just feels right. It feels like that's the way a testimony ought to be. It's not all the junk that happened in the past doesn't really benefit anybody in any really any way. And so I have truly done justice to the word witness. You know, I've witnessed not about my past and my rotten life and how, you know, horrible it was and, you know, and then, you know, I just had a, just, you know, I had a horrible time in school and I had a horrible time with, you know, growing up and I had a horrible time, you know, in my marriage and I, you know, I don't know, maybe I wound up on the street uh, homeless and I was on drugs, maybe I landed in jail, you know, you know, and some prison chaplain led me to the Lord and I accepted Christ and so, uh, you can do what I did. I did that. So you, so can you, and that's it. That's it. You're not, you're not, you're not talking about anything he did. Christ did. It's all about what you did and maybe what some chaplain did and some, and what some soup kitchen did, some homeless shelter did, or what some, you know, what, I don't know what my parents did or what my spouse did or what are you, I hope you're getting the point. It's a very simple point. I don't mean to be critical. I'm just saying that I think a, a testimony, a witness ought to be about, we ought to speak about what Christ did, not a, just spend the majority of the time just trying to sort of outdo one another on just how horrible and rotten our past life was. That's kind of what I see today. The focus, the message, the, the, the interest, you know, the, it, Christ is not sinner. You know, he's sort of on a peripheral edge. He's on the outside edge, you know. He kind of, and he comes in last, you know. I mean, after all we talk about, our, all the time we spend talking about ourselves, he, he kind of enters in, you know, from stage left, you know, at the end of it. And, and it's, but it's really, it's really me, too, that, that, you know, Christ wouldn't have come, even come into the picture if I had not done something. And, and I need, you know, so you need to do that, too. Sorry, folks, I don't see that as anywhere, anywhere near reflective of what our life is, our ministry is, our message is, our identity, who we are in Christ, what God did for us in Christ at a time in which we were completely bankrupt. We came, you know, before him, we, we had nothing to offer. He had, he had everything to give. 
And, and it was only because of him. And, and, and we're just so enraptured by this whole, you know, relationship, you know, with Christ, our life, our Savior, our Lord, the one who, who died in our place, the one who chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and, and the one who sustains and upholds us, the one who's always faithful, the one who, you know, just, you know, our conversation, our message, our ministry, our life, our everything is Him. Him. Maybe people are more interested in human, you know, in, in our own selves. You know, we like talking about ourselves so much that, you know, when we bring him into the picture, it's sort of boring. I don't exactly know why that is, except that we live in a time in which a lot of things have been turned around backwards and for, you know, put the cart before the horse, you know, put our emphasis in the wrong place, you know, and, and, and we... Many of us, I think, have grown accustomed to doing that because that's just what we're taught to do and that's what the masses are doing. So we just kind of fall, step into line and just, you know, conform to the system. Forget about really who we are or what, who he is or what he did. I mean, really, seriously. I mean, let's just, but, but man, we have plenty of time to go down through that, that book and point out other people's mistakes, uh, compare what God says to what's going on in our own life and, and come to the conclusion that we don't match up. We don't really, we're not, we're not all that really truly interested in why we're here. In the beginning, and I hate to sound like John 1, or you know, Genesis 1-1, but in the beginning, it was more than mere curiosity to me, you know, that I, that I had to know. I had to know the answer to a question. I had to know right now, tell me right now, yes or no. Can't wait a minute longer. Got to know. Once saved, always saved, yes or no. Tell me right now. That's about the earliest memory, you know, of mine as a baby Christian. I think that I even, I, I knew even then that if, if it was up to me, I, I had zero chance of going to heaven. I, I believe there was a God, but I didn't, I didn't know him. I didn't know him. What I really missed in all this is that he knew me so this issue of eternal security it had to be settled it had to be settled i couldn't wait another day it, I, it, I had to know right you know who's telling the truth here okay because you know I'm, i've got two ears i'm getting it from both both you know both ends you know yes uh once saved always saved it's better than the plague you know, you you know, you, you just can't you can't get rid of it. No, 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 no. Once saved, always saved. That's a damnable heresy, you know. It's led so many Christians astray. I say and and I'm wanting you to understand that I, I didn't know God at, at this point. I didn't know him. I didn't know him. Didn't didn't know much about him at all, really. And I think that's uh, worth mentioning because in this issue of eternal security, it was all about, you know, I wanted to know, am I, can I, am I going to make go to heaven or am I not? I mean, I mean, that's, you know, it was all about heaven. It wasn't about Christ. It wasn't about Christ. I didn't know him, so I kind of give myself a little bit of, cut myself a little bit of slack there because I, I have to because I didn't really know it. I didn't know it. And so the question then became, well, uh, how shall I then live? Because 
uh, without getting in into any really serious deep dis uh, dispute with all of those uh, people who don't believe in once saved, always saved, which I'm kind of tired of after 40 years or 30, some odd, 30, 40 years. Uh, I came to understand that it was better than the plague. Okay. I was, I, there was no way I was going to, to get rid of, of my identity as being God's child. Impossible. Never going to happen. No matter what I do, born of God from above, his child, and he doesn't begat sons or daughters that are junk. And so I came to realize I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Uh, well, that, that kind of made it even better. Now it's once saved, always saved. And, and I was uh, always his, his child. Uh, he loved me. He died in my place, a substitutionary death. Uh, chosen in him before this place was ever, the foundation was ever laid. The universe was ever laid. So the, the big question for me, naturally, in succession, it followed, you know, well, then how, how then shall I live? I mean, what's, what's next? Okay, I'm, re I was, I'm ready to go. You know, I mean, I was very zealous, very enthusiastic, and, you know, uh, still am, uh, but probably not to the extent that I was. If, if some of you out there think I'm kind of zealous now, you should have known me, you know, the day after our, you know, I came to realize I was his child and that he loved me and that he was working every detail of my life, working in every detail of my life to, to bring my life and my relationship with him to a completion where that I could be with him forever. The big issue came here, uh, as far as the, those that I w was involved with, the individual, the personal individuals that were in my life at that time that God had brought into my life. The big question was, was it being like Christ or was it Christ our life? That was the big, big theological question. And, it, and the question became a life, a lifetime is what it became. That whole question has never, it's not, it's not that the question hasn't been answered, but that whole issue has become so intertwined with my life, my message, my ministry, that it, it has continued on to this very day. My conversation, and I think this is important, my conversation my, never left Christ. Never. It, it, it wasn't that, well, okay, I, I'm, I've been a Christian for a week and my conversation's all about Christ and what He's done, and, but then it kind of got down to me and, and from then on it was just all about me and, and, and you know, it was, and, and you and what you ought to do. Okay, it's me, me, my, my wisdom, my, my genius, you know, uh, it's all about me. It's all about me, and you. So I'm I'm going to pursue this path of spiritual growth, and uh, you know, if it works out well for me, I'm going to get you to follow follow along. You know, with me. It came down to grace versus law, which is interesting because the whole concept of of both of those subjects, the whole debate, the whole argument, you know, of grace versus law. The whole contrast is interwoven throughout all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, woven through it like a golden thread. Well, let me say silver thread. I'll say the golden for, for Christ. And so those early years were a, a trial of my faith. Uh, the Lord obviously wasn't going to bring circumstances into my life or allow circumstances into my life to uh, not challenge that, that faith and that trust and dependence upon Him that 
accompanies such dynamic truth. You know, knowledge is one thing. You know, enlightenment uh, to the truth, propositional revelation. I mean, you know, like I know there's a heaven and I know there's a hell and, and, and you wind up in hell. Uh, you know, didn't do, didn't the, your knowledge of there being a heaven and a hell didn't, didn't, it's not about knowledge at all. We've been given, as far as you and I, as Christians are concerned, we've been given all the knowledge and the wisdom in the, of the universe, in the universe, in the entire universe. It's in a book you probably don't read or study as often as you should, but that's where it's at. It's not in the, the book that, you know, the UFO dropped on the White House lawn that everybody scrambled over one another to get to, to, to read, because, you know, surely that must be some phenomenal thing. And no, it's his word. It's been with us for thousands of years. Uh, it's our source of strength. It's our source of, well, everything. It's, it's the Word of God. So those early years were a, a, a trial of faith, uh, which continues on. It, that's not going to stop. But that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at there in my journey as a young Christian who started out, just tell me, once saved, always say yes or no, tell me right now. I suppose, and, and it, would seem, it would seem almost reasonable, wouldn't, wouldn't you think, okay, you know, that if you're going to begin your journey, you know, your walk as a Christian, a new Christian, that the gospel, the gospel, is pretty much at the center of it all. I mean, Christ is is center, but but the gospel is the gospel. I mean, you know, you know, we can talk about baptism. We can talk about, you know, go down the list. But the gospel is sort of the capstone, you know, of it all. And so, naturally, we we would want to get that right. I believe with every fiber of my being, I got it right from the very start, not, and not, and I'm not, and I'm not in any way saying that it was because of my genius that that occurred, but that I got it right because I just believed in the gospel right from the start, and I've never believed anything else. Now, there are many definitions, there are many, there are, ask a number of Christians, you'll get any, the same number of definitions as to what the gospel is. You know, the good news of Jesus Christ is uh, he, he died for our sins and he was buried and raised and on the third day. Uh, and if uh, you, you need him, you need to know him as your Lord and Savior. Uh, and uh, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And so uh, you, you need to, too, you know, uh, you need to do what I did, and 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 uh, and if you do, you'll go to heaven. If you don't, well, you might go to hell. Uh, but that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the gospel. I mean, you know, it's I can just stand out on the corner with a sign, you know, the end is near, and 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 just yell out to people that, you know, that talk about. Uh, scream at them about all their wickedness, all their wicked ways, and just tell them that if they, if they repent, if they do something, then God will then do something. And because he certainly did that for you and, you know, and that's, that's basically the gospel. It's the same message preached today. And I've done a number of, of, I don't know, I've done many, 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 many videos telling you folks what I think the gospel is and it's none of that 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world to unto himself. He was not imputing men's trespasses unto him, that he's committed unto us the same word of, of reconciliation, the same ministry of reconciliation. That God in Christ did something, it's done, it's not going to be repeated every time someone accepts someone as their Lord and Savior. Okay. That the message that we declare, the, the gospel, is that God was in Christ reconciling us to Himself. And we live in an in a age, a, a, the period, the age of grace in which God is not imputing men's trespasses against them. Seems to be an awful lot of conversation about sin today, but not very little conversation about Christ. I go to church today, folks. I here I am with you in this year, 2023, on planet Earth, in the state of Oklahoma. I don't know where you are. I'm in Oklahoma. And we're all here together. Uh, we're sort of connected by this uh, magical thing called the internet. And, and, and so we're all here together. I, and we all hear the same thing always. We, that's, it's all we've ever heard. For as long as we've been here, I don't care how old you are. If you're sitting in a nursing home and you're 103, I, all you've ever heard, all I've ever heard, is a gospel that is centered upon what man must do in order to appease an angry God. And I have said that is pagan. I've said that's worldly. I've said that's carnal and fleshly. I've said that's the wisdom of man, not the wisdom of God. I've said that that is the power of man, not the power of God. I've said that that's another gospel. I don't hear when I go into any church service in the land, I don't hear any discussion whatsoever, even among Christians in the parking lot. You know, you might want to kind of maybe have something to say to each other when church is out, you know, I mean, you know, just at least a, you know, a few words. Besides, you know, what's for dinner, where are you going for dinner, I'll go, you know, I'll go, I can go with you, you can go with me for dinner or whatever. Certainly inside the church building, you, you didn't hear the nature of man discussed. Not really. Totally corrupt, incapable of doing anything good. We certainly didn't hear the, the nature of the new man discussed. A righteous new man, sinless new man. Made a new creation in Christ, given a, a sinless new man in which sin cannot dwell because God's seed abides in us, and so we cannot sin. So, you know, the, the whole idea of the two natures, old man, new man, in contrast, in conflict with one another, don't want to talk about that. What we want to talk about, it seems, is just cleaning up that old man. And, and maybe if we do, then he'll be the new man. Like this, you know, wait a minute. I, Wait a minute. I thought we, I thought we started out with two, and and we've just always just it's always just been one. Folks, you are a dual-natured individual. If you are a Christian, you are a dual-natured individual. That's why you have the conflict that you do between the flesh and the spirit. We don't seem to want to talk about motive. Uh, the heart motive much, not really. Uh, it's you know, it's it's just. I'm t I'm talking about the reason why we do things, not do do something good. Okay, you know, there's we can talk about doing all the good things in the world, but you know why we do it is a big 
part of the equation and we don't seem to have much to say about that. We don't have much to say about the fact that God has imputed righteousness to us, that we stand before God positionally righteous, as righteous as His Son. Imagine churches from coast to coast here in the United States telling their congregations every single Christian, the, the messenger, the pastor, the angel, reaching out across the, the masses and telling every Christian just what is true of them. And that is, they've been made the righteousness of God in Christ from the greatest to the least, oldest to the youngest, baby in Christ, mature. You've been in the Lord 80 years. you got to kind of scratch your head over that one. I would think that it, you would want someone to tell you something like that. It seems like Christians are either either ignorant or unaware, or they just haven't they haven't come to, uh, you know, uh, realize these truths in their life. Of course, it doesn't make it any easier for all of my practically destroyed brothers and sisters in Christ whose lives have been ruined constantly by all this heaping all this garbage on them that Christ never intended that they bear it's how they gonna how, how they gonna trust God concerning something they never have heard or they don't or they're not hearing and and it's not just hearing it's being reminded over and over again reminded we're to remind one another of many things as Christians made the righteousness of God in Christ what a grand awesome truth that is so thrown hidden in a dark closet someplace I, I don't not so folks I don't I don't hear it I don't hear it maybe you do and now I mean you know I, I'm not saying I never hear it I'm really pushing the, the point here that, that it is so, so uncommon as to be almost non-existent. Sovereignty. God is sovereign. Well, who's sovereign? Man or God? I, you know, folks, that was one I had to settle way, way back, and it wasn't very difficult, okay? It really wasn't. It's not like one of those you know, some of these other major, you know, branches of theology, these theological subjects or, or topics, you know, they're kind of like tough nuts to crack, like, like, you know, kind of like a walnut. It's kind of tough to crack. This kind of was a no-brainer for me. I, I'm, I'm not God. All right? That was it. I, you know. I'm not him. I, I want to tell people that I meet, you know, who profess to know Christ, I want to remind them of the fact that it is strength through weakness. It's when we're weak, we're strong. How can you, the Christian life, be law-keeping as a, how can we have that, the Christian life, uh, law-keeping as a principle of the Christian life? And it, well, I guess we, we, we should just then take strength, the whole, you know, weakness, you know, strength through weakness thing, just toss it out because it doesn't mean anything. We also discovered uh, as we grow in, in the Lord, it's the righteousness that's based on faith. It's not the righteousness that's, that's based on I got to do this or God's not going to like it kind of mentality. What about the fruit of the Spirit? Folks, do you honestly think that if the Christian life, if, if it was about law keeping as a rule of life, do you honestly believe that, that there would be even be any fruit of the Spirit? Uh, you know. So once again, we have a conflict there. You know, it just the, the fruit of the Spirit rules out law keeping as a rule of life because what we're looking at in the fruit of the Spirit is something other than law keeping as a rule of life. I guess, I don't know, that, you might want to play that back uh, a few times.
of course, we don't want to talk about Christ's manifest. We don't want to talk about, you know, and, and folks, I, I'm not, I'm not able to put a lot of verses up real quick up on the screen all the time and stuff like that. It's, uh, 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 I spend more time really working on these videos than I do trying to make them look pretty. But Christ manifest. If it was law keeping, why would Scripture talk about we, you know, dying daily? You know that death works in us, but life in you, says Paul. Why would there be any? Uh, reason for our being baptized into his death burial and resurrection dearly beloved we can talk about how law does not fit into true praise or worship we can talk about how it, it it's in conflict with the whole picture of the vine and the branches him being the vine we being the branch uh, we we can talk about how it doesn't work it doesn't just it just there is no fellowship between law and God causing the growth, you know, you causing your growth and God cause. Well, which is it? I mean, you know, well, oh, Steve, it's a co cooperation. It's a combination of both. It's a little bit of both. So you and God, you get together, you put your talents together, and and that's when you you work the best. Is you know. Law keeping as a principle of the Christian's walk doesn't fit anywhere into the idea of spiritual rest. It doesn't even it doesn't even fit into the picture of the believer's walk itself. I mean, just the walk and how Scripture tells us to walk. It doesn't say for us to walk under something that it says that we've died to, which is law. It doesn't work when you compare it to myself, the best I could ever do. You know, I mean, my own, my righteousness or my own righteousness is, are as filthy rags. You can't compare anything that you do to the person and the work of Christ. You can't compare yourself and your works to the person and work of Jesus Christ. You just can't do it, folks. Stop. <laughs> okay? Stop. You can't do it. I mean, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to come to the point in which Israel did, where they, you know, were given the law, couldn't keep the law, uh, were told that they didn't keep the law, that they couldn't keep the law? Israel being an example for us. I understand, folks, that there are do's and don'ts in the Bible. I understand that there are uh, what, you, what we call uh, uh, scriptural imperatives. Okay, they're, uh, especially you see it in the grammar, the mood of command, imperative mood. You know, it's a command. It's God's command. First one in the New Testament is Romans six eleven. Reckon yourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's that's an imperative. That's a command. That's the first thing you're commanded to do is reckon yourself dead to sin. And you, you get up off your knees after being bankrupt and you set about your whole entire aim, your, your life, your message, your ministry is going in a direction in which you are. Well, let's let's wait a minute. Let's see. Now, hold on a minute. Uh, wait, we just. We just we just can't we just. We were just bank, we were we didn't have anything to offer, and now we are all of a sudden we're the fulfillment of God's every need. Well, Steve, it's just try the best you can, leave the rest to God. You know, Steve, try the best you can, just try the best. I know we're Steve. I know we're not under law. I know we're under grace. I know that. I know we're not under law, but just but just do the best you can, and leave the rest up to God. Just, just, just. It's still law, Bubba, okay? It's still law. I understand there are a lot of scriptural imperatives, folks. I do. I, do. It's, I want you to stop and think. The flesh profits nothing. 
It's Christ, His life, manifesting it through our lives. It's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. He, the vine, we, the branches. It's God causing the growth. It's, it's right, the righteousness of God based on faith. Okay, it's not a read it and do it, kind of do it like Nike, do it, you know, kind of thing. It's not, that's not the mentality. That's not the direction that we want to go at all. How could God have ever expressed, how could we even have a picture, a portrait of, of our Lord if he had not given us written in plain language imperatives, okay? It's not that they're, just because there are imperatives and there has to be imperatives, Otherwise, we'd know very little truth. Doesn't mean that we're under law, those imperatives, as a principle of life. Of, of, doesn't mean that at all. In fact, we've died to that. It's how. It's not what, it's how. It's how those imperatives are. God fulfills those imperatives in our lives. Well, there's one other thing, and then I'm, I'm about, about out of time. One other thing I want to mention is, is we're told to, well, but Steve, okay, no, Steve, we, we're told to keep his commandments, all right? I mean, I know we're told it somewhere. I don't know, I can't, I don't know where. We're told to keep his commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments, Steve. Keep my commandments, all right? You're wrong. We've got to keep his commandments. The word there in the Greek for keep is guard, like a prison guard. You know, like you run a stoplight and get thrown in jail because, you know, you get mad at the officer and, you know, kick him in the groin. And so now you're in lockup overnight. You're, you're in jail. Kind of like one of them things. And So you got this prison guard, and he's guarding you. That's what you're doing with his commandments. His commandments. Not Notice note it doesn't say that if you love me, keep Moses' commandments. It doesn't say that. It says if you love me, keep... If we love him, we keep his commandments. Well, so whose commandments is what I'm asking. And, you know, of course, you know, but everybody's mind tends to want to go back to the law. Well, New Testament rules, instructions, that's the same as Old Testament law. It's all mixed, mushed up together. So, you know, folks, we're not under law. We're under grace. There's much more I could tell you about my past, but uh, my, it's so much more fun to just talk to you about him and what he's done. Look, I love you all. See you Sunday. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.